So it's time for me to formally introduce everyone to today's webinar on how to make your agents more productive. Um, we have two great speakers today, and uh, the first of our speakers is uh, Daniel Ord. Uh, Daniel, for those who, people who've just joined us, do you want to explain a little bit about uh, what you do at OmniChat International? Sure, no problem. For the, ba the past 19 years or so, we run workshop certification programs and speeches around contact centers and CX. And we also do a lot of mystery shopper research these days on digital channels, including chatbots. People haven't heard about mystery shopper on chatbots, but it's been a very up and coming thing for us. So it's been interesting to see. Mystery shopping is always, I think, uh, an undervalued uh, exercise for many uh, organizations. And I think, yes, yeah, that's a really great. And I know you have lots of great ideas to uh, share with our audience today. We also have Mike Murphy, who is uh, currently uh, experiencing some audio issues, but he will be with us very shortly. Am I, can you hear me? I'm looking oh. still here. Oh, yes, we do have uh, you still on there, Mike. Sorry, uh, I believe now is the perfect time to introduce you then as well. Uh, do you just want to explain a little bit about um, your role at Genesis for uh, everyone yeah. here? Yeah, so um, uh, I'm Mike Murphy. Hi, everybody. And um, uh, I work on the on the Genesis side where we kind of onboard new customers. So um, I've been very much involved with this sort of area of the industry for uh, for a long time. And I've seen a lot of examples, if you like, of, of good things happen and also some bad things happen. Um, mm -hmm. So I've got a few ideas I wanted to share with the audience today, and I look forward to that. So I have an audio issue, so just forgive me if I, if I transition. So um, I'll do that right now, and thanks. Excellent. And I'm sure, as I've uh, seen both of uh, Daniel's and Mike's presentations, and there's some really great insights. And I think it's a very good topic um, that everyone uh, in the industry is interested in. And with this kind of in mind, I'm sure that you uh, listeners also have lots of your own best for, um, best practices for um for improving advisor productivity so if if you do and if you just want you want to kind of just watch on you can join our chat room this week by visiting www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat and that's always great to pick up extra nuggets of information and an added benefit of being in our chat room is that you can download our speaker slides to reflect back on any learnings from today's webinar. And you can also download the chat log so you can reflect again on the, some of those best practices that I discussed. And we also have um, a join quiz link. I will also explain how you can join the quiz after Daniel's presentation uh, if you're not in the chat room, but it just makes things a little bit easier if you're in there. Um, yep, so what I like to do when uh, I'm watching one of our webinars is to watch our great uh, presentations on one side of the screen and have the chat room in the other so I can just keep keep tabs on both. And just a reminder to everyone that you can watch the replay of the webinar and uh, look again at the slides, uh, which will be available later this afternoon at www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars. And for the best uh, for the best tip in our chat room today, we have uh, a bottle of champagne, a box of chocolates, or an Amazon gift voucher on offer. We also have um, these prizes on offer for the winner of our quiz uh, at the end of Daniel's presentation. So that's just a nice little uh, something to look out for. But I think now is the perfect time to uh, pass over to Daniel uh, to take us through uh, your presentation. So uh, Daniel, I'll pass the baton over to you. Thank you very much, Charlie. Well, it's terrific to be here with you guys again. And let me just double check. You're able to see the presentation. Show my screen. Yeah, excellent. Brilliant. OK, so here we go, guys. Let me just move this over. Da, da, da. All right. So when you guys came to me, you said, let's do a, a webinar on how to make your agents more productive. And I think that's a super title. What I did was I added an additional title, not to complicate things, but I call this how to bring out productivity in the contact center ecosystem. And one of the reasons I've, I've added an additional title is we're going to talk not, not just about agents in this presentation. We're also going to talk about how other stakeholders contribute to productivity, because I think that's really important. You've done some wonderful introductions already, Charlie. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And that's me standing in front of a place called Cluster Eberbach, which is a location here in Germany where we run some of our workshops. It's quite pretty. So, Now, on to the real task at hand. 
if we're going to do a webinar on productivity, I thought, well, we better define what productivity is. So I did what everybody does. I went to Google. This was the first hit I got for a definition of productivity. So I'll give you a second to digest that. And what I find when I work with contact centers, and it doesn't matter where that is, the moment someone starts talking about contact center productivity, they're typically talking about how many or how fast. So how many live chats did my agent handle today? How fast is my agent able to cycle through these telephone calls and so forth? And I think you'll see by the time we get to the end of the presentation and along with Mike's, it's probably time for us to broaden this definition beyond just how fast and how many, because there's a lot more going on. And when we look at the contact center, different stakeholders have very different contributions to productivity. So as I talk through this today, I'll start first with agents, because I think that's the right place to begin. How do they contribute to productivity? Then I'll move on to contact center management, where I think there are some very interesting things to talk about in terms of how the management team. And when I say management, I'm talking very much about the senior management here. Not so much the team leaders, I'm talking more the directors, the VPs and those folks. And third, last but not least, I'm gonna talk about customer experience management and how they contribute to contact center productivity. But I have to be very clear, not everybody has a formalized customer experience management function. And I'll remind us of this again when we get to that part in the presentation. So with that said, Charlie, I think we've got our very first poll question here. Beginning with agents, what do you guys out there use in your center to track or measure or validate agent productivity? So Charlie, I think I turn this over to you now. Yes, I've uh, taken over control and uh, I will officially launch uh, the poll. And the poll is, uh, what do you use in your contact center to track or measure agent productivity? Uh, please select all that apply and your options are number of contacts handled, average handling time, occupancy, adherence to schedule and first contact uh, resolution. Uh, as the answers come in uh, here, Daniel, what kind of results are you expecting? Uh, <laughs> I have a very strong sense of what I typically see, but I'm going to say something. Typically, the kind of people that attend your webinars, they're what I call a self-selected audience. So I'm hoping to see some slightly different answers than I typically see out there in my practice. But out in, in the practice world, you still see, if you want me to go ahead and say it, number of contacts handled, average handling time. And funny enough, you even still see occupancy out there, which we're going to talk about as being completely incorrect. So what have we got out there? There you go. Yeah, okay. There we go. I'm saying, okay. I'm saying, yeah. Yeah, very much a variation as you were alluding to there with 70% saying number of contacts uh, handled, 65% yeah. saying average handling time, 27% saying occupancy, 48% yep. adherence to schedule and 44 uh, first contact resolution, which I think is uh, very interesting and a nice place to uh, hands control. Back over to you, Daniel. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. And I will be gentle. I will be gentle. Okay, <laughs> that's my job. All right, give me two seconds here. So is my screens back up? Charlie, can you mm -hmm. confirm? Yeah. yeah, brilliant. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but these are the wrong ways to measure agent productivity the number of contacts handled and service level based environments. Now, when I talk about service level based environments, we're talking about things like calls, things like live chats and things like messaging, not email, not correspondence. And that is completely wrong. Um, I'm not gonna go deeply into this because as you know, I write a lot about this, I teach a lot on this. And I think even at Call Center Helper, you guys speak constantly about this. I usually say to folks, if this is unclear to you, it's time to get some solid operations training. The second thing is targeting agents on, on high levels of average handling time or saying that agents are largely in control of AHT. That's simply not true. Most studies show agents control at most 20 to 25 percent of AHT. The factors that drive AHT include things like the complexity of the call, the, the um, 
forgive me, the technology that the agent's using, the processes that they're required to follow. So again, some level of AHT, but not a high level, certainly not what you see a lot of contact centers using. And the third one, occupancy rate. Well, occupancy rates driven by factors which are completely outside the agent control. And occupancy is never targeted at the agent level. It's always used as a very high level metric to tell us how much our resources are being used. So we've got to throw these out straight away. And, and, and I, again, I don't want to spend too much time here. I'll simply say for those folks that, that find this slide a little breathtaking or surprising, there are the right answers out there for you to, to sort this out. And, and I strongly recommend some solid operations training or reading. So I'll move on from here. Now, there's a terrific video that I'd like to share with you. For It's a very American one. It comes from I Love Lucy in the 1950s, one of the funniest shows ever. And I think this reflects an interesting view of how a lot of contact centers look at agent productivity. So, Charlie, I'll let you bring that video up here. I think we've got two minutes of hilarity before we get back to <laughs> so <laughs> Before we get serious again, so. Uh, Excellent. Yeah, Charlie, pass control. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Thank you. I mean, imagine every piece of chocolate that you see there on this video is a customer. So if you're running your contact center like an industrial output center or an industrial factory, that's what your customers are going through. I won't say they're necessarily getting eaten or thrown into a hat, but obviously very bad things are happening to them. So. So with that said, and I hope you enjoyed that, um, what do agents bring to productivity? Well, the first thing is they, they bring their adherence to schedule. This is the number one productivity measure for agents working in service level based environments. They have to be in the right place at the right time. And the main reason for that is when they're not, that's when we struggle with things like our service level, customer wait time, agent engagement, abandonment rate, and all of our metrics. So adherence to schedule is considered to be the primary or the most important metric for agents in a contact center environment. The second thing they bring is they apply their knowledge, skills, and abilities. We define what quality looks like or what quality sounds like. We train them, we coach them, we orient them, uh, and of course we expect them to kind of take our hand, take our advice, and follow what they're 
they're asked to do. So admittedly, this is probably where they're making some contribution to, for example, average handling time when they apply their knowledge, skills, and abilities to control the call. But that's only one aspect of AHT. And I think the third thing with agents that's really emerging is this willingness to learn multiple contact channels. Agents become much more valuable to us when they're willing to learn things like, hey, Dan, I already handle voice. Can I learn to do live chat? Or Dan, I, I can handle messaging well. What about email? Because it makes us easier for contact center managers to move people to be in the right places at the right time when we've got people that are multi-skilled or cross-trained in different areas. So these are the three things that sum up what agents contribute to the productivity equation. Let's carry on here. Now it's time for me to talk about contact center management. And so the question I'm going to ask, but we'll answer together is, what are the choices that senior management in the contact center makes that are gonna ultimately impact the productivity level? And I've got four. And the first one is pretty straightforward. I think it's a senior management responsibility to choose the right metrics and measurements for agents. Obviously in the contact center, you've got to choose the right measurements and metrics for everybody. But in this webinar, we're very much focused on agents. And I can usually tell how a center is performing once I ask this question, what do you measure your agents on? And that answer alone will tell me, are we measuring people on the right things? By the way, I've added a little note down here on the right-hand side, which says quantity cultures don't equal productivity cultures. Okay. It's time for us to uncouple this belief because that's taking us back to the I Love Lucy video, isn't it? When she says, speed it up, she's talking about <laughs> quantity culture. So that was the purpose of the video. Now, the second thing, now, I'm going to bring in first contact resolution here, and I know that th there's a lot written on this and a lot of talked about on this, but I think it's an important consideration, and it's a management responsibility to do what I call design first call resolution. Now, let me, let me talk through this. The first thing to be aware of when we talk about FCR is we're talking about the demand side, and when I say demand side, I mean the customer contact demand coming into us. The supply side in my mind are the agents. They're, they're the ones who are handling the contacts. And here's what many contact center managers say to me today. Dan, we've been working on the supply side for years and we continue to, we train, we coach, we get Genesis, we get these great technologies, we get knowledge bases. We really help optimize agents on the supply side. But over time, we've kind of picked all the low hanging fruit. So strategically, we realize we have to also look at the demand side. We have to understand why customers are contacting us because some of those contacts are things that are really useful and valuable and build a relationship for us. And frankly, some of those other contacts aren't so great. So again, with FCR, you're looking at the demand side. You're looking at understanding why customers are contacting you. Now, the main problem with traditional FCR, and you'll notice I use the term traditional, is it basically says this, let's answer the question the customer asked. If they, if they ask this, we answer this. If they ask for X, we answer X. And and boom, we get FCR and QA is happy, the manager is happy, everybody in the contact center is happy. And that's when you begin to see these really incredible and almost unbelievable rates of FCR, 70s percent, 80 percent. I've even seen people claim that they're delivering 90 or 95 percent first call resolution to their customers. But the problem is, is that's not how customers think about it. At the end of the day, FCR is supposed to be designed from the customer point of view. So how does a customer think about this FCR? Well, obviously, if, if they have a problem with X, they contact you and they say, I'm having a problem with X. This is what I'm experiencing now. This is the question I have now. What a customer absolutely doesn't know is what are the potential future issues that may crop up down the road? Maybe not exactly the same issue, but something related to that original issue. So what happens if they contact us again in two days, five days, four days down the road? Again, not necessarily with exactly the same question, but with a question that's peripheral to or related to the original question. So how does that get handled? Well, if you look at traditional FCR, it's going to be completely ignored. It's going to be not even understood because the way traditional FCR is going to look at it is when the customer asked us for X, 
we handled X. Yay, FCR. When the customer asked two weeks later for Y, we handled Y. Yay. And then when three days after that, they asked us about Z, well, we handled Z beautifully. Yay, that's three FCRs. And everybody's happy in getting this wonderful FCR rate. But that's not how customers think about it. That customer is going to look at X, Y, and Z essentially is all one event. And they're going to say to their loved ones or their neighbors, this company is really hard to do business with. I had to contact them three times to kind of sort this all through. Because let's be honest, they're going to blame the company for not preparing them for the things they need to know, the things they need to know that are going to pop up in the future. So what I love is, yes, FCR is a step in the right direction. I'm not saying throw it out. But today, I think the thinking is, let's not just eliminate the unnecessary repeat contacts. Let's really take a look at the elimination of unnecessary additional contacts. That is really the way to stop and think about it. And when I talk to contact center managers, I simply say, be brave. Start looking at it like this. Admittedly, your FCR rates are probably not going to look as fabulous and wonderful as they did before, but you're going to gain a lot of things. You're going to eliminate these future additional contacts. You're also going to build greater customer loyalty because they're going to have an overall better experience with your center. So I think this way of looking at FCR, sure, it's getting us in the right direction, but can you really start to look at how do I eliminate unnecessary additional contacts, which are those peripheral issues? That's a, that's a management decision because agents wouldn't know necessarily how to do this. They can participate with you and talk to you about the things they believe, but ultimately management designs FCR and then trains and coaches agents to follow that. So that's my second point. It's a big one. Let's go to my third point. Channel optimization. Okay, the concept of channel optimization is pretty straightforward. It says, let's match the customer's inquiry to the channel that's best suited to handle that inquiry. So for example, I doubt anybody out there wants to do tech support over email. That sounds like a nightmare, right? Or how about explaining a complex or sophisticated product and service over live chat? I love live chat, but live chat doesn't work so well with very nuanced conversations. On the other side of the coin, why are we getting such simple questions in our voice when that could have been better handled by self-serve or a chat bot? So the whole idea is let's handle the contact in the channel that's best suited. Sounds great, doesn't it? But the research that I read recently says less than 25% of contact centers do this. And the reason seems to be this. There's a belief out there that if we simply offer a lot of channels, just simply now offer live chat, offer messaging, offer this, offer that, that will automatically make customers more satisfied. But that's not true. It actually creates a big guessing game in the minds of customers. Because when they have a problem or a question, they're confronted with, oh my gosh, which channel do I go to to get this thing resolved and get it resolved in the easiest way. Should I maybe use my favorite channel or is there an alternate channel that I should use? So it presents a lot of confusion to customers here. And in fact, sometimes they just default to phone because at the end, if I can't figure out what channel to use, I use phone, which is why some centers say, we haven't seen our phone volumes drop as much or stabilize as much as we had expected. So. My point here is, do you see the picture of the St. Bernard? Be the St. Bernard. Now, if you don't know about St. Bernards, basically they're dogs that operate or live primarily in the, in the Alps, the Italian Alps, the Swiss Alps. And for hundreds of years, they've saved travelers and guided travelers who have to go through these various dangerous uh, snow covered passages in the Alps and they save their lives and take them places. So guys, please be a St. Bernard to your customer. And if you want me to get practical here for just a second, what a lot of companies do is this. When the customer first presents their contact, they'll ask one or two diagnostic questions to find out what the contact is about. And then they'll say, you know, Mr. Ord, to solve that, maybe the best way is I just give you a call right now. Or to solve that, why don't I push uh, this YouTube video to you and you can play it yourself. So in other words, we're trying to help customers get their contact solved quickly and easily so that they're happy, not that they're playing a guessing game. Now, the fourth thing is technology. And this is where I'm going to definitely defer over to Mike very much. Um, obviously, your technology can help you. 
uh, knowledge bases and routing and all the cool things Mike's going to talk about. Um, on the demand side, you see a lot of chatbots coming out so that they can reduce the demand that's being presented to agents. Because let's be honest, running your contact center, the financial cost of running your contact center, hiring people is very much linked to how much demand is coming in. So if you can work to understand that demand, which I spoke about earlier, you can also optimize the financial costs of running your center. And by the way, the reason I chose this picture is I'm fascinated by the chatbots that help agents. I'm fascinated by all the tools we're giving to agents to deliver a better experience. And I know that you'll learn more about that as the webinar goes on. The last part of my presentation, the last stakeholder is what does CX management bring to productivity? Now it's very important to say at the outset that CX management is completely different than contact center management. I see a lot out in the industry where contact center people are rebranding or renaming themselves as CX. And, and I kind of get where that's coming from, but it's a bit weird because the jobs are entirely different. The contact center is a profession, CX is a profession, and sure there's some overlap and working together. Um, but let's keep in mind that CX experts have a certain set of know-how or understanding of the discipline. And what do they bring to the productivity equation? Well, these three points on the screen are all super related. Um, they can help eliminate unnecessary contacts in the first place because sometimes these contacts are driven by other departments. And in a lot of organizations, the contact center manager doesn't have the authority or the power or the status to get another department to basically fix things or stop breaking things so that customers keep contacting uh, the center. But CX management does. CX management's also really good at culture, what I call a vigorous focus on what's good for the customer. Obviously, you have a culture in the contact center, which is very customer focused. But sometimes when you talk to the other departments, you're not so sure that they have the same level of commitment to what's good for the customer. And CX people help put in this organizational perspective and overview of culture, which by the way, contact center people can contribute to, but again, it doesn't typically fall under their purview. And the third point is the ability to work across boundaries. So CX management, if you have it, if you have a formalized CX function or strategy taking place in your organization, they can also can contribute to your productivity in this way. So let me sum it up. Um, this is how I look at productivity. When we manage which contacts that are coming in, that's demand. We get them to where they're best handled, that's channel optimization. And we design how we should handle them. There's your next contact avoidance, your FCR, your quality. Then your productivity becomes an outcome, not the overarching target. You end up achieving productivity, but it's not a, I love Lucy, let's put as many candies across the conveyor belt as possible. Because you can imagine in the I love Lucy contact center environment, quality and customer engagement and employee engagement aren't going very well. So we not only optimize the costs of running our center in the long run, I like to say we turn our agents into powerhouses of engagement and loyalty. And so thanks very much for letting me ramble on about agent productivity, <laughs> contact center management productivity, and CX management productivity, but it's a fascinating topic and I'm so happy to have a chance to talk about it. So Charlie, what's next on the agenda? Ah, the quiz. So I'm Charlie, we're having problems Charlie, with your audio. We can't hear your audio. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Uh, apologies for that, everyone. Um, yeah, I thought there was great, lots of great stuff in there, Daniel. I think um, I think from the poll question that we had in there as well, I think your point about schedule adherence being the best of those metrics that we presented at uh, measuring productivity was very key um, because it's, some, it's, the, it's the only one that the advisors have complete control <laughs> over. We have FCR supposed to be designed from the customer's perspective was a point that I really liked as well. Mm -hmm. um, and lots of great points on that uh, part. And then um, take the time to understand which channel is best suited to uh, which contact type and lots of uh, and the value of that. Lots of great stuff, as I said. Um, but now it's time for our uh, quiz uh, off the back of that. And um, so on your phone or on your PC, if uh, you go up a new tab and go to www.kahoot.com, so that's K 
a h o o t dot i t uh, and then add in uh, the pin which is four seven eight one three o and uh, use a chat uh, use a nickname. It's great if you use uh, the, your name if you're in the chat room, just because uh, it'll be help us to get the right uh, prize to the right person. Because there is a bottle of champagne or a box of chocolates uh, or an Amazon gift card voucher um, for the winner of this prize. So there's an extra little incentive to go uh, in there. So yeah, I'll just, uh, just let the last few uh, few people join. I see we already have uh, almost 40 people in in right now. So it's uh, great numbers. And yeah, I'm sure the uh, little addition of the box of chocolates or the Amazon uh, gift vouchers will hopefully have uh, inspired a few more uh, people to join the chat room. Excellent Thank stuff. You. I think uh, now's a good time to start. So let's uh, uh, go to the first question of today's quiz. Good luck. <laughs> uh, so which of the following metrics is the best indicator of agent productivity? Is it average handling time, service level, schedule adherence, or occupancy rate? And I'm sure that uh, for those of you listening to Daniel's presentation, this one shouldn't be too uh, difficult for you. Hope not anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Let's have a look at the uh, answer uh, here today. So yeah, it's schedule adherence as uh, the majority of people have said that. Ooh, I'm so happy. Believe <laughs> 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 that. Um, yeah, and that's uh, it's because the only metric of those presented that advisors have complete control over. That's true. Uh, so the next question is, which is the better measure of agent effectiveness? 50% productivity plus 50% quality or 50% <clears throat> productivity plus 50% occupancy? We're, so how many seconds do we have to answer? We have 20 seconds there, so make sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. And let's let's uh, see the results of this now. So uh, yes, and uh, most good. people right there with uh, with uh, fifty percent productivity plus fifty percent quality, and that's because occupancy is a measure for the WFM team and should not be applied to the advisor role. That's a right. very important measure for the WFM team, as Daniel uh, also said, but not for the advisors there. Um, so yeah, next question is, which of the following productivity boosters are advisors not primarily responsible for? Uh, adherence to schedule, elimination of unnecessary contact, application of knowledge, skills, and ability, and flexibility to learn skills across multiple channels. I believe this was another one that uh, was in Daniel's presentation. As you can see, we've taken a lot from, uh, <laughs> from his slides here. And yes, the correct answer was uh, elimination of unnecessary contact, which uh, again, most people got. And we see Lauren is ahead at the moment. He's on fire. Lauren's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Great to see. So the explanation is while advisors can help to eliminate unnecessary contacts, this is done through application of knowledge, skills, and ability. Eliminating unnecessary contacts should be a focus for management. Mm. Uh, so I move on to the next question, which is according to a poll on call center helper, what's the biggest uh, cause of stress of contact center advisors? And I'm sure this could be another uh, interesting topic. So the options are unhappy customers, high contact volumes, job demands or complexity, and uh, broken processes or other departments. This is, might be a bit more of a challenging one as this one didn't come from Daniel's presentation. But uh, we'll see <laughs> the answers here. Were you, were you listening? Yeah, and well, still a lot of people getting that right mm. there with um, with the correct answer being broken processes and other departments. And I will say that this was a very close poll as well. But in 2016, 37% of course under helper readers reported that broken processes and other departments were the primary causes of their uh, contact center stress. Mm. Yeah, nice bit of research that we thought we'd share there. Cool. And the final question is true or false? Designing first contact resolution should be a key focus for contact center advisors. Or false, true, as it says on uh, the screen there. <laughs> Just making our minds. Crafty, Charlie. Crafty, yeah. Charlie. Crafty. <laughs> <laughs> <You're> trying <laughs> to trick us there. Yeah. yeah. I'd be a few people who uh, I'm sure have. Uh, <laughs> there. Uh, yes, uh, so false, 21%, and I imagine my trick was uh, behind yeah. 
behind that I, one. I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> yeah. So the winner is Scott uh, there as uh, we can go to false. We'll go back to the winners in a second. But the reason why it's false is that the agent part is only in applying what they've been taught. It's up to us to create the training program that supports FCR as a target, perhaps as an a perhaps using agent insight in doing that as well. So I think that's a that's a nice little thing there. And let's have a look at our podium. So third place uh, is uh, BB. Uh, well done, BB. And uh, second place <laughs> is Natalie. Very close to these scores. Lots of uh, great stuff. And first place oh. with the spotlight is uh, Scott Twenty. So congratulations, Scott. Congratulations, yeah. uh, well done. Fun. I like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good gang. Good gang. <laughs> It shows that it shows that a lot of people were listening to your presentation there as well, Daniel, which is a, which is a sigh of relief. <laughs> Poor Lauren. Lauren was doing so well, but but just fell away. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> excellent stuff. So if I show my screen again now, and so yeah, congratulations, Scott. We'll be in touch after the webinar. See if you would like a bottle of champagne, a box of chocolates, or an Amazon gift voucher. But quickly now, before we move on to uh, Mike's presentation, just going to go to the chat room, so go through a couple of top tips and questions uh, that are uh, that you've been sending in the chat room uh, to share with everyone and get uh, perhaps get Daniel and Mike's thoughts as well. Uh, so the first tip sent in by Jeannie is: we started recording videos on the on the issues our agents are having trouble with. Uh, the most so they can watch them when they feel like they need refreshers. I think that's a, a nice, really, really nice new way to engage with uh, the contact center team there. Uh, another tip sent in by Amber who says, we require all new hires to sit with our frontline uh, teammates during orientation. This helps them to understand how their jobs impact the customer and how many ways the customer will seek assistance, which is uh, again, a very, it's a very nice tip yeah, there. Nice one. Uh, so we have one in from Dan who says, we actually introduced IVR routing earlier this year uh, as our support desk deals with very different products and the agents is trained on those specific products. This was generally, uh, this was greatly received by our customers knowing that they only spoke to someone in the first instance that could offer them FCR. And I know this is a topic uh, that you're going to get into uh, a little bit on your presentation, Mike. So we'll uh, save, we'll, we'll come back to that one, if you will. Um, we have another tip in now from Stephen, who says we have a, we have set up an agent panel who use who we use to run through any changes to our new, to to our new initiatives. We have they have also helped arrange the team away days and implementation of new software. They are a voice for the staff in the contact uh, in the contact center team and have been invaluable. What do you think of this uh, tip, uh, Daniel? I think this it seems an interesting one. Well, I mean, it's this whole voice of employee thing, which mm. is such an important topic. So I see it as VOE, and I love that the way I love the way he wrote this that we give them a seat at the table um, that they're represented. So it makes perfect sense to me, and should have been something we've all been doing all along. But we need people out there like Stephen Thirty Four to remind us. So. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And um, I think that's a very great point. And then uh, we come probably for a final uh, question of the chat room for now, but we'll come back to it. It's from Dan who says, does a happy agent equal a productive agent? Over the past three years, we have increased bank holiday allowance, increased lunch breaks, introduced free healthcare, redeveloped shift patterns and introduced other well activities. What we struggle with now is everyday drive and motivation. Is there a better way? I think this is a great question to ask both of you actually, but Mike, I'll start with you on this. Oh, oh, thanks, Charlie. Yeah, <laughs> That's a big one. That's a big one. I mean, like, um, I, I, I love the investment that you've made, if you like, in the in, in the teams. That's, that's that's really cool. Um, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of perplexed really by 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 that. If, if that's the kind of response. So, um, yeah, uh, Dan, I'm, I'm sorry, but to kind of batter to you. Can can you actually give a better insight? No problem. I think you can't confuse happy with productive. I talk about this yeah. when we teach engagement because. Here's what a happy agent sounds like. Oh, I like where I work. My boss is really nice. By the way, it's really close to home, so I don't have to travel too far. The pay is pretty good. So all the things that drive happiness have zero to do with productivity. So it's kind of a misnomer to assume happy translates into productivity. But I want to issue a word of caution here. It depends on how you define productivity. So that was my first thing at the top was, first off, a happy agent doesn't necessarily equal a productive agent. Although, you know, again, I'm being very specific about what drives happiness. 
But I looked at the last line, what we struggle with now every day is drive and motivation. Yeah. So that's a different question. So does a happy yeah. agent deliver drive and motivation? Does a productive agent deliver? I I'm seeing three different variables in this question, not just two. And that may be what's making it hard for us to answer this because uh, does a happy agent equal productive? No, absolutely not, not necessarily. I, I guess the real question here is what can we do to keep people inspired and motivated and so mm. forth? And I mean, there's a lot of ways, but can I just bring up just one very quick one that we talked about in the presentation or maybe yeah, two? One, measure people on the right things. I have seen agents transform when they're measured on the right metrics. In a center that targets people on quantity handled, you're going to have a big problem. Once you fix those measurements, you'll instantly see most of your agents will say like, oh my gosh, I finally get to do what I'm good at. And the second thing, which we talked about in the presentation is encourage this level of cross training across different channels. I mean, what I see is sometimes voice people just get bored of voice. Email people just get bored of email. So while you may not be able to promote people upwards easily in contact center, you always have opportunities to move people in terms of lateral skill sets. I want to build your skill sets here and build your skill sets there. So a long answer to the question, but you can see the question provoked all of us over here. So yeah, I think that's that's a great point actually to uh, it kind of ends today's um, <laughs> the chat room section for now because I think that idea of uh, your final idea, especially of not just thinking in terms of flat structures, but moving advisors laterally as well, is a yeah. is a very uh, important one actually, and uh, one I really liked. And I think um, now is the time to go into our next poll question. Uh, which will launch into Mike's presentation very well. And that is, how do you expect your contact volumes to change over the next four years? Is it to greatly increase, uh, to somewhat increase, to uh, stay stay fairly much the same, to somewhat decrease or greatly decrease? So yeah, Mike, I think what kind of answers are you expecting to see here? <laughs> <laughs> that's my that's my that's my slide number two. <laughs> so, um, I'm putting you both on the spot well, um, today. <laughs> you are you really today. You're just getting straight to the point. Um, so so I'm 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 kind of curious really because I I I yeah I'm I'm curious. I'm going to leave her that. But I'm going to give you that political answer. Apologies. Okay. <laughs> let's, let's see what um, let's see what the, the listeners are saying and and uh, just share the results with everyone. <laughs> And yeah, it's, uh, it's a very varies again uh, across uh, across uh, the yeah. viewership. Yeah. But thirty one percent is the biggest percentage there, saying greatly increase. Thirty percent saying somewhat increase. Eleven percent says yeah. saying twenty three percent somewhat decrease, and five percent decrease. So I think most people yeah. there are expecting an increase in contact volumes. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Okay. And I think yep, now is the perfect time <laughs> to hand the battle on over to you, and I'll let you launch in. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Let me just put up my uh, screen here. Okay, confirm it's coming through okay? <clears throat> yeah, perfect. Yes. Excellent. Okay, great. So uh, thanks everybody for your for your um your your score there really on the on that poll question. That was really cool. Um what I'm trying to do really is to um put some I suppose technology perspectives to to the uh to the to the webinar. And um you know I, I know from experience if you will we've been very effective I think at um you're getting ourselves internally, you know, uh, efficient, organized, structured. Uh, I think we've learned how to do that really well, like around the sort of like the voice sort of channel, it's like the call center side of things. I think there's a fair bit of improvement to do around digital. But I like to kind of view the agent productivity, if you like. I kind of I kind of see your group of agents as the greatest asset that you have in your contact center, in your in your in your operations, uh, because they're the people who are facing your customers, the most important people. Uh, are, are faced by your agents every single day. All right. So from that perspective, how can I best, if you like, empower your greatest asset? Is kind of a, a quest that I have, if you will, from a technology perspective. <clears throat> and to kind of sort of like feed into uh, Charlie's poll question, um, here we have some uh, research from from Gartner. Okay. So it's it's credible research. Um, it's twenty it's twenty seventeen research. So it's not like it's, it's brand new. But if you will, it's, it's very, I think, topical and very sort of like to the point because in their estimation, there is going to be an explosion in customer interactions by 2022. Okay, an explosion of customer interactions by 2022. So back in 17, if you can remember back that far, if you were doing 100, then in 2022, you're going to be doing 350, um, whether you like it or not. 
So from that perspective, just just think about that and um, think about the consequences, the consequences that's going to have on your greatest assets. Okay, your your agent teams. Uh, think about how I'm I'm sort of thinking. Well, surely I can't sort of scale my sort of agent teams by 3.5. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. It kind of depends on the on the economics. But it's like it's a, it's an interesting sort of project, projection from from Garda. Now, now clearly on the back of that, then they sort of see some sort of you know areas, if you like, of, of expansion as well around things like automation and chatbot, which is really cool. Uh, the IVR, if you like, taking up the automation section. So again, you can see some significant growth there. And you know, I've been kind of working with self-service tools for a long, long, long time, and uh, I've sort of seen how they become quite static, uh, quite um, you know. Uh, sometimes frustrating because they're so static. But if you will, the modern version of, of this kind of capability is really, really cool. And uh, yeah, I, I kind of agree with Gardner about that kind of growth projection. And um, we should see quite a lot of success there. But if you kind of notice behind the kind of graphic, the, the kind of the, the voice, the blue box, if you will, doesn't deteriorate that much. So they don't sort of see a decline, if you will, in, in call volume. There is some decline, but it's not if you like uh, as material, I think, as everybody might think. So, you know, like the, 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 the talking, you know, agent is not going to go away in time. Um, it's going to kind of hold its own. But I think we've got to get you know, the other things around the agent far more effective to make sure we give um, the agent productivity a better chance of success. So jumping into sort of a couple of ideas here, really, from, from, from my perspective, there's a whole bunch of economies talked about out there. And, and um, some people talk about the digital economy, which is kind of very relevant to the subject, you know, this, 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 this area that we all work in, customer experience. There's a lot of talk about the internet or the web economy and how that's kind of transformed, like look at how it's transformed retail. I mean, like it's shockingly transformed retail, you could argue. Um, think about the subscription economy where, you know, we, we no longer wrestle with kind of DVDs and sort of CDs. We kind of click onto something and pay a subscription per month and we kind of get whatever it is that we want um, on a, on a per, you know, per, per month basis. So uh, as individuals, as businesses, that subscription economy is becoming very, very much more material. Um, the services economy is, you know, you'll have heard about that in the news a lot, you know, it's a big core part, if you like, of, of, of you know, UK PLC. Um, but also then it's like the information economy and, and people kind of think about data is the new oil. And, and absolutely, I think it absolutely is. There's, 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 there's credibility behind that point. But, but the core of all that, behind all of that, if you will, is a human. And, and don't forget that, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do here really is, is be more effective in how we connect your customer to your agent, your agent assets, those great assets. The, the agent teams. <clears throat> and here we have a kind of a, a scenario, if you like, that I think is still prevalent. And that's this idea, if you like, of um, you know, the zero context customer, customer service. And what I mean here really is like, I kind of get myself into an unfortunate cul-de-sac. And I find this really, really frustrating as a, as a, as a consumer, as a spender. I kind of feel, if you like, when I, when I get into this scenario, I feel the brand I'm working with are letting me down. That's, that, that's just brutally how I feel about it. And it might be a case of you know, I'm being asked a question, um, maybe in technology, and I give some information, and then when I get to speak to somebody quite cheerful, they either ask me the same question again, or they quickly understand what I want and then sort of transfer me to somebody else. And to me, that's just like, it, it doesn't kind of feel like I'm working as a team. I kind of feel um, you know, these guys aren't necessarily on, on my wavelength. Um, something which is kind of interesting and kind of emerging from our perspective or based upon these experiences is that we have like predictive routing. And what we're trying to do here really is leverage the kind of the great processing power we have in the cloud these days and start to build smart and, and like uh, effective profiles of our people, um, our, our agent teams, and build smart and effective profiles of our customers as well. And using this kind of like uh, unlimited resource from, from, from the cloud, using like AI type tools, we start if you like matching these profiles, and you can see on the left in the white box, I've got a sort of a, a simple profile of a of a customer. Uh, information that I've gathered over time that allows me to kind of take a take a perspective on this this calling customer. Across the top, then, if you like, I've got some profiles, if you will, of, of agents. And what I'm doing here really is just sort of mapping the sort of like comparisons between one and the other. And what we notice over time is, if you will, that there is a uh, like we, we can actually make written decisions. Forgive me, I went too quickly there. We can make written decisions based upon what we call like the predicted outcome from the conversation. And we know, for example, that for this customer right now, in the past, Josh or Stephanie were the kind of best people to actually handle this query um, and actually get the outcome that we want from, from, from the call. So I would say expect to see more from predictive routing because we can start to get a bit more deeper, a bit more 
intimate, if you like, with both the, both the agent and also with the customer to a, a greater effect. And I think these type of tools, if you like, get us away from the you know, longest available agent type, type thinking, uh, you know, call flow A, call flow B, call flow C. We start to get a bit more strategic with our customers. So, um, yeah, but that's what I think is going to be quite effective and, and quite important for us. So then the next thing I kind of wanted to talk about was like lifting away those sort of like mundane questions. Uh, that, that become quite frustrating, if you like, for your, for your colleagues. And, and the, like a, a classic one of those, if you like, was ID and VR. I'll come back to that, by the way. But just ID and VR kind of find is a very sort of daft thing for me to, me to be spending uh, like a uh, lot of money on my greatest asset for them to be doing 15, 30, 75 times a day. However, um, with automation, we can do smart things, if you like, easy things, helpful things, like, like ID and but other things as well. So um, think about bringing automation into your, into your operations. The, the, the smartphone, if you like, has really empowered this area massively. So it's, it's not a case where it's like IVR only, although it can be. But if you will, we can start to get, if you like, this sort of like self-service across any sort of channel of choice, whether it's social, uh, whether it's online, whether it's uh, like through the phone call, uh, maybe using natural language. You know, like the, um, that, that's also still an effective way for, for customers to get what they want. Uh, especially if you're going to like a, a multilingual contact center, if you're sort of like working throughout Europe or internationally, then being able to kind of have these sort of what we call micro apps. Um, an example of a micro app, app would be uh, like a, an ID and D or a redemption date or you know, those type of mundane or regular questions that you would get in the contact center. And to be able to kind of design something and then deploy it across all the various channels you know, in, at the same time, it's just very refreshing, very revealing, very liberating very very cost effective and it's also as a consumer it's very consistent so it kind of i kind of feel the brand is again on my side and then think about where, where what dan mentioned earlier in his presentation um by going through if you like an element of automation getting myself id and v understanding what it is the customer you know what i want and and, and the contact center actually can know what i want when i get through to somebody who actually say yeah mike i can help you with that straight away so this 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 that, that, that. i'm immediately into a conversation about resolution and that's a very refreshing feeling to get from a, from a consumer's point of view. And um, I think the more we can kind of aim for that, but let's start the conversation with resolution methods rather than who are you, what's the problem? Okay, so that, that's the kind of thought I'm trying to get to behind here. The next uh, element, if you like, is something which is going to be new for the, for, the, for the contact center, I believe. So we're very familiar with our online activities. We spend a lot of money online. You can see the trends around that are just, just growing, growing, growing. But also, if you will, I think it's starting to become something of interest within the contact center. And you know, we have got the capability right now to be able to sort of see across the online activities who is doing what and when and for how long and why. And the nice thing about that is I can start to build profiles around the people online right now who I would actually like to converse with. And the reason why that's useful is because I kind of see the like, productivity in the contact center becoming nothing just, not just a case of serving the demand, but also, if you like, uh, responding to customers, if you like, uh, like, like opportunities and questions. And I think this is an interesting area where, if you like, the more productive, if you like, uh, the more sort of like availability of those great asset resources that we have, I think the more effective, if you like, some of the outcomes might be, and certainly, you know, achieving like revenue growth, sales growth. Um, think about the earlier sort of like technology, the predictive routing. Yeah, so being able to kind of see this customer doing some stuff online, check to see who's available in the contact center, or well, I can see a match there. You know, I think this customer would do well talking to Mike right now, make that connection and we can look forward to a good business outcome. So that's becoming, I think, very interesting and would certainly have a sort of an impact on productivity. But imagine that productivity measure would start to you know, um, accommodate things, not just like, uh, you know, like re resolution times and those type of things, but also like revenue growth. Interesting. I think it's something for the future for sure as far as our operations are concerned. The next thing I want to talk about is messaging. And um, messaging is something which we sort of see as being quite a, uh, how is the word? It's becoming a little bit more formal. It's starting to get more and more effective. If you like, there's, there's starting to be a sort of a, an element of awareness, if you like, amongst the giants in, in, in sort of like uh, mobile, in sort of like uh, in um, automation, in social. They kind of see, if you will, how messaging is becoming very important for, for consumers. And, and think about your every day. You're, you're kind of going through your day, you're living your life, you're doing your work. You still have, you, you have something you want to resolve. I want to fix my smart meter or I want to get my smart meter replaced, whatever it may be. On the go, I'd like to have the idea of being able to do this through messaging. 
And the fact that I can just kind of like put my phone down, do my work, then you pick my phone up again, see there's a response there from somebody, take an action, send some more information. What you start to see now, if you like, is a, an interaction happening with this customer, which may involve 12 different messages over three or four days. But kind of like where Dan mentioned earlier, it's actually one transaction. And that's an interesting sort of like a way to sort of think about how tomorrow is going to be affected, if you like, by the greater use of messaging within contact centers. Um, some of the, like I said, some of the sort of like the, the, the major international brands are kind of behind this and kind of driving this. Um, some of the examples, if you will, that we can kind of see here, they just kind of give you a feel, if you like, for where some of the sort of like deployments have, have taken kind of customers. It, in a way, it starts to become a channel in its own right. Uh, it's part automation. It's, it's kind of part self-service. It's, it's, it's part involves the agent. So it's quite interesting. It's quite uh, smart and it's quite elegant. And I quite like it. So again, from that perspective, I think we're going to be seeing quite quite a lot of these type of ways for for conversing and connecting and doing something different and refreshing with your customer as the as the as we look forward. Um, okay, so then the last thing is kind of like uh, it's, it's kind of really important for me, by the way, just so you know. Um, I really hate the idea of having technical tools, the technology tools, kind of getting in the way of success. And unfortunately, as I kind of talk to my customers and, and, and to my prospects, I kind of see this more and more, unfortunately. Now, you know, multi-channel is a lot of sort of um, cause of that, if you will, because it kind of brings in, well, we're going to do something on social over here with this sort of provider. And we're going to do something on SMS over here with this provider. And we're going to do something on uh, email over here with this provider. So you end up with a whole bunch of different technology providers. Fine. No problem. But think about your greatest asset, your agents. How can they wrestle with these different types of media? And you end up with these silos, which become quite pointless, like, like Dan mentioned in, in, in this session. We've kind of got to get to the point where we're looking at something more sort of all-in-one, more kind of easy to use. These, these are out there. They're available. Uh, they're sort of like easier for you to onboard new people. But if you will, they kind of take into account, if you will, all the different media types that are A, here right now, but B, are going to be available at, like in the 18, 24 months ahead. So I would say be ready for that. And, and also as well, if you like, not so much on the interaction handling, but also on your customer information. Think about the tools your agents have to work with every day around the customer information. And, and, and you kind of saw from that research that Charlie showed you how you know, the highest element of frustration is around broken processes and broken systems. I mean, that's just appalling. Nothing that the agent can do about that apart from leave your business and go elsewhere. And that's why if you have high attrition rates, check on that, because that's probably a core reason for the, your, your, your agent getting frustrated. Otherwise, it's probably a great place to work. But if I'm spending every day rattling around through machines trying to answer questions, which I just can't, I'm going to get frustrated. And guess what? There'll be somebody else down the road. Okay, so that kind of brings me to the end, Charlie. I hope that was useful. And I look forward to the feedback from the audience. Excellent. Great. Thanks for that, uh, Mike. And loads of uh, great points uh, there, as always. Um, I'll just launch a demo poll first, and that's for everyone who wants a demonstration of the uh, Genesis solution. Just to, um, if you just press yes to the poll, and we can uh, get that sorted for you. I was going to say, yeah, lots of great information there, Mike. I really like the idea of predicting uh, predictive routing being uh, used yeah, more definitely. and more to utilize the data that we have to create better conversations. Um, and that I really liked your graph of how a messaging transaction might uh, happen across the day and how one transaction may be over the course of 12 messages throughout the day. I thought that was a, that really brought that to life to me. And of course, to think about installing technology from the advisor's viewpoint is a, mm. is a very key, especially if you want uh, those productive uh, advisors. So I'm just going to uh, hide that poll now. Excellent stuff. And uh, we'll go to our, back to our chat room. And it's been uh, busy as ever today. And our uh, first tip is coming from Brooke who says, we've recently got our managers to provide their journey stories, giving agents more insight into how to get further into their careers. This helps some advisors to get inspiration. We may even go as far as to get agents to sit with higher level of, of management to see how they can get to these levels, which I think uh, is a nice one there. Yeah. Uh, we have a question in from Tom, says, does anybody use gamification software? Does this help motivate people to deliver the right outcomes? I know, Mike, that uh, Genesis have some sort of, sort of game affiliation do you uh, want to take this one yeah I mean like it's, it's, it's there I suppose I mean like my, 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 my experience says there's a few fundamentals you kind of got to get right and then I think gamification has got a good role to play but if you're trying to use gamification to solve fundamentals that are wrong 
you're just kind of chasing shadows. Yeah. So I, I kind of feel make sure you're in the right sort of, if you like, uh, you, you've addressed those kind of core issues that we kind of discussed on earlier between Dan and myself. If they're in good shape, then absolutely. It's, it's a great play. If they're not in shape, you're just going to make it worse. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, kind of ensuring that you know your key drivers uh, of your uh, yeah. Yeah. your key motivational drivers for your advisors before you kind of go into ahead into the gamification yeah. market is a very key is a very key point. Uh, we have a tip now from Dennis who says um, once an agent identifies a broken process, we ensure we get buy-in from the involved departments by clearly demonstrating how the proposed change would generate improvement for them. Good not for our contact center. This goes a long way to break down resistance to yep. change. I think that's, uh, that's yep. a very nice one. And one final opinion to end on now uh, is from Stephen, who says, I work for a housing association. We are much more focused on the customer experience and FCL rather than traditional measures. We have done a lot of work on our team page. It says the process maps on it and all the documents mm -hmm. the officers need to be able to respond to the majority of, the, of queries. First call resolution has improved from around 60% a, uh, a year ago to almost 80% now. I think that's a really great one. Daniel, what are your yeah. thoughts on this one? Yeah. I, I mean, FCR is a step in the right direction. So an improvement in FCR shows a lot of work went into this. I also love seeing people say rather than traditional measures, if it's a traditional measure and it's wrong, it should have been thrown away long ago. If it's a traditional measure, like adherence to schedule and it's right, then it's worth carrying forward. But I like the mindset that this person, Stephen 34, they're questioning things. And I think that's what I see the best contact center managers doing these days is they're literally sitting, sitting down at their, their tables and chairs with everyone and saying, let's question everything. If you're willing to do that, I think you're ready for the future. Absolutely. I think that's a very uh, nice uh, point there again to end uh, today's webinar on. But a few things before uh, we go, just in a few words, uh, if you could put in the chat room in one or two words, what did you like uh, best about the webinar? Was we really like to gain your feedback? And of course, the winning tip for our second bottle of uh, champagne or box of chocolates today or Amazon gift voucher. And say that goes to Amber, who says, we keep our mm -hmm. teammates motivated by our culture. We have one key goal, and that is the customer's needs. Therefore, we only track CSAT quality and adherence. We want them to focus on, this, on the services they provide and not to be a number, which I think uh, is a very uh, nice point that summarizes uh, today's presentations very well. And again, um, to complete, the, uh, we, again, we like to attain your feedback. So if you complete our survey when you leave the webinar um, by filling in just four quick questions, that would be excellent. And just a reminder that if you want to catch up on the, either Daniel or uh, Mike's uh, presentations later today, uh, if you go to www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded dash webinars, they will be available later this afternoon. And we also have uh, the next webinars in our series. We even have one for 2020 that's uh, live now, and there's still time to register for that at www.callcenterhelper.com forward slash webinars. So the last thing for me to do is to uh, thank our speakers. So thanks uh, first, Daniel, for joining us today. You bet. It was super fun. I look forward to the next time. Great. And thank you too, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Perfect. Thanks, Excellent. everybody. We'll be back next week. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.